better be it. They're big contributors to Ain't That Swell. They keep our engines turning. More content, more programs, and just support the crew who support the potty, mate. It's that simple. Keeps us going. <laughs> Mad. Cool, man. How you going? Pretty good. Yourself? Yeah. No complaints, man. Um, yeah. What's going on down there? I understand uh, the swell season's kind of kicking off pretty hard, huh? It's kicking off, yeah. It kind of had a lot of, like, almost good swells. <laughs> There's, um, yeah, kind of still a little bit of junk and everything. It hasn't lined up to, like, be any amazing days yet, but definitely feeling like winter, kind of more of a normal winter than the last few years. So yeah, it's, right. Uh, it's exciting. Hopefully something. <laughs> hopefully something's brewing soon. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I'd give you a call because, uh, yeah, this continent's about to start pumping, so I just thought it'd be a good time to link up with one of our – all-time favorite call lords. It's been a while since we've had you on the program, man. I think it was uh, way back during a bourbon-soaked night at uh, Ulladulla X Servos, maybe, with your dad. Yeah, that was right. I think got Oki on there. <laughs> yeah. It was a good night. That was a while ago now, a few years. Yeah, yeah. Oki and uh, Pam Burridge and Mark Rabbage. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of touch base with you and, and catch up with what's been happening in your world. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, what has been happening in your world? I, I understand you're in Chopes pretty recently. Yeah, I was over in Tahiti for that last swell with with the rest of the world, I think. <laughs> it was pretty pretty insane. Um, yeah, and then before that, we was in Ireland for a couple of months. So done a lot of time, a lot of time over there as well. Um, oh, interesting. So, uh, and that island trip, was that instead of going to Hawaii? I mean, they kind of pump at the same time, don't they? Kind of, yeah. It's always a bit of a bit of a way up to like leave Hawaii. It's kind of like the <laughs> the staple zone, but I feel like it was worthwhile. It's um, yeah, did a month in November over there. That was when Nate Florence was around too, and like scored a bunch of waves, and then did yeah two months from February to March. And I was planning to go to Hawaii between that, but it was, yeah, kind of four grand flights and nothing lined up like amazingly over there. So kind of just put all my eggs in the Europe basket, which yeah, seems to have paid off, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So um, that must have been the first Hawaii season you've skipped in ages. Oh, I kind of, I've had to skip a few because of COVID. I'm definitely True. due to come back there. <laughs> it's, um, it actually feels like forever. So it's, um, it's something I'll lock in for sure this next season. And yeah, it's saying, I think they're saying El Nino as well. So it could be a really good year. It's, yeah, that'd be, um, definitely, definitely one to be there for. Mental. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's touch on Chopes, man. Cause, uh, it was a bit of a circus and, um, I mean, I saw Nate Florence given the the kind of jet ski uh, versus paddle debacle, a, a bit of a spray. Uh, he was pretty off like what was going on uh, in terms of people whipping versus people paddling. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. I mean, first of all, let's just talk about some of the, the best waves and, and standout performers from that as well. Um, I think the locals are the standout performers. Uh yeah, Matahi got a crazy one. The Emio guy got um got a, like one of the best paddle waves ever, probably like the night before it really pulsed. And yeah, Gilbert, a young local kid over there as well. He's um they're kind of in my eyes the top three performers out there every time. It's um uh, <laughs> yeah they know the place back to front. And then yeah, Nate Florence is always a pretty standout performer. He's um. He had a good paddle window early. It was kind of meant to be a tow day. So um, my mate Connor and I had like spent the morning prepping skis and everything and got out there probably 45 minutes after sunrise and yeah, rocked up and it was like, looks like a pump and paddle day. <laughs> and it was like Nate and about three others out there. So yeah, we quickly did a U-turn and got paddle boards, but he got some pretty good ones in that window. And yeah, kind of they're, I guess, the standout performers in my eyes. Mm. And talk us through the swell. So yeah, it was you know talked up as a kind of code red esque swell, but it just didn't quite eventuate that way, did it? Yeah, I think the um the thing has been pointed at Surfline quite a fair few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were definitely calling um 
yeah, like in comparison to like some Friday the 13th swell like two years ago that was like one of the best toe days ever. And yeah, really um like hyped it up and had that live stream. And I guess everyone flew in, booked jet skis and everything. And then when it wasn't a crazy toe day, everyone was still just in that mindset of towing and they'd kind of spent all that money to get there. So it definitely became jet ski wars out the back. <laughs> True. Yeah. I was wondering about that. Just the, the resource spend on, you know, getting to a country like Tahiti, which is not a cheap place and, you know, getting your hands on a jet ski, uh, man, like you must feel like you kind of have to justify the spend, like to spend all that money and then not use a jet ski would also be kind of weird to. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know. You can always tie it off to the boy and go for a paddle, but <laughs> a lot of people end up towing and there, there were some crazy tow waves that went down for sure but with the um yeah the locals are definitely definitely hold it down so they should and they were on pretty much all the good tow waves so it was pretty much a war between the blow-ins getting the <laughs> getting the kind of like 10 foot ones that would have been nice to paddle so yeah it was good to see a few a few other high profile people um yeah like speak out against <laughs> being towed around all day yeah yeah so how is it how is it working when you're out there in terms of i mean uh yeah just who gets to go what waves like how how is that decision being made and was it or was it just a full shit fight um it was a bit of a shit fight i guess it's always the locals first that's like anywhere you go but then yeah it's kind of everyone else is battling for the scraps (laughs) a little bit which if it's if it's a proper pumping paddle day and there's no skis it's kind of um it sorts itself out okay like it's not too bad because i don't know it's like a pretty big intimidating wave and a lot of the time there's only one or two people in the spot anyways so it's um yeah definitely that like one little entry entry spot regulates it a bit but then yeah when you add a bunch of jet skis it kind of it seems to become a bit of a free-for-all especially if you if you're paddling in the lineup and then yeah, someone's already towed the wave 300 metres up the reef. There's, like, nothing you can do about it. They, if they see someone paddling, they can't kick out, and, yeah, you're just going to land right on them. So it's definitely, yeah, you can't really just go. Wow. Yeah, that's high-stakes poker, man. That's so scared. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, uh, yeah, definitely pretty, like, high adrenaline the whole time. Fuck, man. Yeah, you could see how uh, tempers would fray, and uh, w- w- was there, like, you know, stern words exchanged or any like near bus stops it was all pretty civil actually it was um yeah kind of for the paddle it's just disappointment really like no one was really getting angry i think a, a few of the locals there were some local bodyboarders who were paddling as well and they were definitely their tempers were up a little bit i think which is fair enough if it's your if it's your local zone and a bunch of crew fly in <laughs> start whipping paddle waves but Wow. Yeah, between us, like we're we're only visitors as well. It's like, but yeah, it was definitely a little bit, a little bit disappointing. Yeah, it's a hard one, man. Like, I mean, how do you manage a situation like that moving forward? Like, you know, it just seems like the, you know, the Pandora's box has been opened, and you you can't put jet skis back in the box now. And uh, you know, I guess like in a lot of ways, it, it's pretty karmic and ironic because. I guess the pro surfing fraternity has a lot to answer for in this respect. You know, they've been used um, in ways that they shouldn't have. And now your average Joe now believes he can use them in the same way that they've been used. I mean, like, as you were see on the East coast, you see them in fucking four to six foot. Yeah, and shit. <laughs> Pretty heavy on the points as well. Yeah. But, and I guess now it's uh, yeah, ent- entered the, the slab realm. I mean, they kind of started in the slab realm, but now they're, yeah, it's just allowing people to get into positions on waves that they couldn't ordinarily get themselves into under their own steam. And that seems to be, that's the crux of it, isn't it? It just seems kind of disrespectful to the the culture and the art of, uh, you know, heavy water surfing. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's funny, like, there was that big boom through, like, the 2000s to maybe 2012, 2015, where, like, jet ski slab surfing was, like, all the rage and then it like for those next five years it became like so uncool like even if you're towing like a 20 footer at the right or shippies where it was like completely warranted and still not so it was like you just didn't like get any recognition at all and now it's almost gone back the other way a little bit i guess like that's like any trend in surfing i think it kind of 
teeters back and forth, like one extreme or the other. So hopefully it's just a little phase and gets pulled up a bit again. But yeah, it's funny. You'd, yeah. You'd get kind of get laughed at if you were telling an eight footer at Chopes a few years ago. And now, yeah, some pretty like high profile people are doing it. These yeah. Schools. Yeah. It's uh man, it, it's interesting. Like you would think that, you know, the heavy hitters that are paddling on a day like that, um, you know, yourself, Nate Florence, Billy Kemper, Cole Rothman, like um, the Lokes, Gilbert and, uh, you know, Matt Hyen and these guys, you would think that no one would want to kind of transgress because of the esteem that you guys are held in. You're at the absolute peak of the sport and, and generally in most sports, like, the the heavy hitters like the apex predators kind of set the tone in the culture but it's surprising to me to see that um that it's your the way you guys want it to be is not necessarily the way it is right now yeah it's it's definitely a funny one for sure and that that day that every 45 minutes to an hour there was a crazy toe wave so that was like yeah Matali and Jill but we're out waiting for those and they were they were getting those as well so that was, um, yeah, I'd say if they were paddling in the lineup, it would have uh, come to a stop pretty quickly. <laughs> but, yeah, it's kind of, I think now, like, since that, everyone might have looked at, taken a bit of a look at themselves and maybe they maybe they won't do it again. Maybe I'm just hopeful. But I think, um, yeah, the way it was perceived, even in the general public, it's um, probably not going to be something they'll want to do again if it's, like, kind of medium-sized chirps. Man, it was just a circus. Like watching on that Surfline broadcast, it looked unbelievably psycho. Just the amount of people in the lineup, you know, all the skis buzzing around at the top and people paddling uh, on, on the ledge and then all the the spectators in the channel. Like you've never seen more people in a lineup that psycho before. Yeah, it's pretty insane. It's like, <laughs> it's yeah, definitely like a one of a kind place that, I guess it allows for that. It's got that crazy deep channel and it's so on the spot, but it's, um, yeah, it definitely feels like water world. It's, but you do, when you paddle and you do go into your own little zone and kind of forget about, like it probably looks worse than it feels from the, um, from the channel and like on a live stream because you're sitting in the lineup and you kind of just blank out the <laughs> flotilla of boats and people in the channel. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't want to be thinking of anything else as you try and knife on out there, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it just trips me out too, like the amount of argy-bargy that must go on in that spectator channel. And you see boats go over the falls, like, I mean, the iconic Pete Frieden going backwards over the falls back in the day. And then there was a, a another one, like whatever it was last year, that dude just kind of avoided it. But like, you know, just people getting, people kicking out and hitting jet skis and shit. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's freaking, it's... It's something a bit off about it, eh? Like it, it, it's like I, I get that there needs to be broadcasts and uh, you know photos, and that that's like a big part of you know how you guys make a living and, and how surfing functions. And I, I, look, I'm watching the broadcast, so I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, like when people's safety is, is being jeopardized, and uh, including the surfers as well, like oh man, it, it, it's crazy, eh? We we live in a weird. <laughs> world man like there's no laws there's no rules so people are just fucking doing their best to like sort it out themselves yeah it's pretty insane i think um uh, it seems like the taliation government might be cracking down a bit more on what goes on out there especially after that boat last year but yeah there haven't really been rules put in place yet but yeah i'd say it'll take something pretty bad to happen and then yeah, it'll kind of get get regulated a bit more, I'd say. Unfortunately, yeah, the reason it'll uh they struggle to regulate it is because they don't know how to read swell charts. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they put it on. It was weird. They put the whole island on that code red alert. Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah with like thinking it was going to be huge. Which I talked to some people and they thought it was like just like the Tahitian government doing it. Like they hadn't put much thought into Chopu, but then other theories were like they were trying to um settle down the channel on those big crazy days with how many people were coming in but yeah I'm, I'm not i have no idea how it all works behind the scenes but it definitely did when that was in force for like the i think the afternoon when the first the swell first hit and then till midday on the tow day it was like way nicer in the channel like a lot of the taxi boats are 
they'll just take tourists out for a spin, like, I don't know, 100 bucks a pop, <laughs> just, like, drive a boat full of tourists out, do a couple <laughs> laps for an hour and then come in and pick another, like, 20 people up. Yeah. So be making a killing, but when all those taxi boats weren't out there, it was just so much nicer in the channel. It was, like, a bit more room to breathe for sure. Yeah, it's hard to begrudge the local Tahitian tuna fisherman, like, his urn on a day like that, you know, making a little – like, that money's going a long way. Definitely. It's definitely, yeah. Like if the locals can profit out of it, that's yeah. At least, um, at least they're the ones making the bank out of it. Totally. Totally. And yeah, you, you mentioned Island man. Uh, it's so crazy that the lives that you guys live just going from like the tropics to like five mil weddies and back and forth and uh, just chasing the most psycho waves, man. Um, yeah. Talk us through the Stinson Island. So, november and then uh i guess uh you went back again in february march yeah so did about three months in total pretty much used up every day of the three month easy for europe so it was yeah november was like i think all the locals were saying it was like one of the best runs as well they've had so it was it was pretty much non-stop like you come out of a couple of days of surfing and you'd have like maybe one rest day and then be back on which was um yeah it was pretty nuts to do a whole month of that it was like probably bigger than like most Hawaii stints I've done with when you get crazy runs away, especially doing it in the freezing cold. <laughs> but, and then, yeah, that February, March was a lot, definitely a lot slower. It kind of was, I'd say like normal Ireland, you wait a few weeks and you get like a few days of good waves and then wait another couple of weeks. But yeah, it was still good times. Love made a lot of good friends over there that I yeah, see every time I go back. So Always, yeah, always good hanging in the downtime there. Yeah, the November run. So, I mean, yeah, how do you go backing up? Like, fire out, man. How is the surfing experience up there different to, say, other parts of the world when you factor in the cold and, and the wetties and, and just the constant run of swell and, and exposure to the elements? Yeah, you definitely um, definitely can get pretty weathered up there. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, need to thaw out. They've got a lot of saunas around and, yeah, good good pub fireplace is a good way to defrost. But yeah, you do after like a, a week or two, you do get pretty used to it. And yeah, like wetsuits and clothes are pretty good these days. So just the hardest part's getting in and out of your suit if it's like sideways rain and freezing cold. But it's um yeah, when you're actually surfing, you're not really you're generally not not really cold. But... And who's your crew up there? uh yeah connor mcguire who's yeah always getting bombs at mali he's um yeah he's become like a really good mate he's stayed with us last year in australia and kind of go over sometimes i'll crash at his or other times get a place to rent but yeah a lot of good local crew like that garage mcdade he's um he's ripping and charging as well and yeah just a lot of crew in the town as well that like don't really have like huge name surfing or might not even surf, but yeah, made a lot of good mates over there. And Noah Lane as well, link up with him a bit when he's around. He's a Aussie, <laughs> Aussie guy in Ireland now. So. True. And, um, and Connor, yeah. How did he go at, uh, at Chopes and, and out here in Oz? Um, yeah, he had a good time in Oz. We didn't get like the best runaways, but still had a, um, had a good few runs, took him on a big, like, 24 hour road trip to the desert and had some fun waves down there. He was pretty, um, pretty stoked on that. And then, yeah, Chopes, I think he was just coming back from a bit of a knee injury and was really hoping for a big toe day. And yeah, the toe, the toe swell didn't really eventuate. I think he ended up having a few fun paddle days, but yeah, he was, um, yeah, his head was definitely getting like a 20 foot toe bomb out there. Yeah. <laughs> and we looked at, we had a ski there and we we're looking at the lineup. We're like, there's no way, like we're going to get it. So might as well just come back next time and try and do it properly on a, on a big toto. Mm. And where's the level of Irish surfing at? I mean, it's such a, a, a new thing there really. Like, you know, it was kind of in my mind, you only really are going back to the, the twenty. 20- tens or maybe a few years before that with, with mickey and fergal smith and, and and those guys like uh really sending it on um yeah. <laughs> fucking heavy slabs around the hinch and elsewhere and um 
but that said, like I remember spending a couple of weeks with Fergal over there and, uh, you know, going up and down the coast and, and you could see the level, it was pretty, pretty high already. Like, uh, you know, there wasn't the kind of household names like he was at the time, but it was surprising how good guys were surfing. I, I was just tripping out. I was like, fuck, these guys are wearing so much rubber. They're doing punts. They're doing crazy hacks. They're getting pitted. Um, and I think some of those guys you just mentioned that they were the guys I was seeing and now they, they've come of age. Um, yeah. Where's it all at up there? Yeah, it's, it's definitely pretty high and it's improving a lot. Like there's a lot more people surfing now, even when I first went there probably six years ago, but there is, yeah, there is a pretty long history of surfing. Like even before wetsuits were really a thing, which is pretty mad. It's, um, <laughs> that is mad. Yeah, it's, it's exploded a lot in the last few years. Um, but yeah, it is, it's not something like, or before going there, I didn't think there was like a core surf crew and surf shops around in a lot of towns and everything, which, which there are. So it's, it's pretty cool to see it's yeah got pretty strong footings there. Totally. And yeah, I, I just want to be clear that of course, like surfing has existed there pretty well as long as it's existed in most places. But uh, what I meant was just like yeah, the fucking the, the, <laughs> the full send mode, like at, at, at the slabs was uh, a relatively new phenomenon when I was up there. Um, and yeah. And talk to us, I mean, about the, the right bomby. it's fairly blown, like the name and, and there's crew on it all the time, but I'll, I still won't name it here, but man, one of the best waves uh, in the world on its day. Yeah. It's, it's pretty insane. It's um, yeah. It took me a long time to score it. I've done a lot of time there and only surfed it for the first time last year. And then since then, probably had four pretty good swells. Like two of them were like in like probably 10 out of 10 days out there, which is pretty lucky. It's, <laughs> it seems like a really hard one to get good. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty crazy setup. It's super intimidating. You kind of got to scale like this crazy cliff. And then you kind of, you're on your own out there, like where it washes you when you fall, it like puts you into this bay of like cliff that you can't get out of. So the only way out is to get like back out through the waves and like paddle out and around the lineup. So yeah, you wouldn't want anything to go wrong out there. Actually, I broke a board one day last year, I think when Nate was out there and had to like do the big, one, probably the biggest swim of my life, like out and around the lineup. <laughs> wow. It's pretty nuts. And yeah, if you do get the right one out there, it's definitely like wave of life material. Yeah, it's a, a crazy setup. Uh, I remember going there with Fergal and standing on those cliffs and looking down at it, and it was, you know, dead flat. But the setup, like, you kind of wonder, like, how did the first people find a way down there and, and, and you know, cotton on to, to surfing that joint? Like, I mean, you can ask yourself that about plenty of waves, but, yeah, that, it just seemed like <laughs> so outrageous, the setup. Yeah, I think they ended up paddling from a town nearby, which is, like, it's a few kilometers of cliffs before they found the little goat trail down the side. <laughs> so like they, yeah, they paddled from <laughs> whichever town's closest, but yeah. I love pretty, that. Yeah. Pretty crazy story. That's so classic. Um, and yeah, I mean, watching some of the footage of your, your sessions out there, like fire out, man, you got one out there that was like, it, it would have been every bit as, as good as Nate's one. Um, That's just kind of dropped on the internet, but you, you didn't quite get out the end of it. You, do you know the one I mean? I think so. Yeah. The, the, um, the shock I've got me at the very end. <laughs> yeah. Talk us through that one, man. That thing is fucking, it, it's psycho. Like it just, it's a full grower. Like it's a huge pit. Yeah, there's some that kind of come in like closeouts out there, but they do peel. I've had I've had a couple now where I've been done on the end of them, but but yeah, you kind of it's weird for a barrel that size normally like taking off and knifing it and just kind of safety stancing through like one section, but it's like it's almost that length of a barrel where you need to like breathe and concentrate on like yeah, you really it's like you're weaving through a four foot barrel where you need to pump through sections. It's like yeah, pretty, pretty mind blown. I don't think I've ever experienced that anywhere else where you like, I was, I was riding a seven, two and you're like pumping it as hard as and fast as you can and like trying to ride high over like foam balls and stuff. It's yeah. Pretty, pretty incredible wave, like pretty yeah technical for a wave that big. That's amazing. I think it was a uh, droid or I don't know how you say his name. Crazy. You see the, the goofy footer? Yeah. Garage. I think. Garage. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> that was the, the biggest <laughs> butchering of his name. Sorry, brother. <laughs> Everyone does it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he got that crazy one out there, a eh? backside. Uh, oh, yeah, he got a mental one a couple of years ago. Yeah, and it, it, man, I guess there's a certain kind of wave out there that just has must. Yeah, look like a closeout has a big line on it and, and just tapers it and and kind of grows. And I guess they're the fucking end game, which yeah. tones you you're looking for. Hey. Yeah, you definitely know them when you see them, but it's pretty it's pretty intimidating to turn and go. It's like, yeah, you feel like you should be going left, like or like on the shoulder of the left, and that's kind of the spot. But but then you do get ones that break off the reef there. It's not like it's like the most perfect wave ever till it gets to like ten to twelve foot, and then there is a like just death chandelier that can come down on you. So you see that a bit. I think Lowy got nailed by one when they were surfing it in the early days, and um yeah, it's definitely in the back of your mind when you're looking at that thing feathering before it doubles up. Like, you want to be pretty sure that it's gonna gonna hold. Oh, that's a sickening thought. And how is Lowy, man? I mean, uh, you were obviously there for uh, the swell where he was injured. Did, did you see what went down there? Have you, have you spoken to him since? Yeah, I think he's he seems to be going a lot better. I've sent a few messages back and forth, and um, yeah, helped helped round up his gear. Uh, it was pretty heavy. It's watched him. We actually watched the wipeout from the channel. There was like a few of us there and could tell he fell pretty awkwardly and watched him get up and he was, yeah, he was like on his board and we're like, that looks kind of weird. And then saw him take a few paddles in and it it was right when it just got crowded and we're like, oh, he seems to be on his board. And cause he must've just been in so much pain. Like you don't think to start waving to people. And saw him go over the lagoon on the way in, and then a jet ski went in. And they're like, oh, "We're like, oh sweet, like if he's um, if he's hurt, the jet ski will be onto it anyways." And yeah, I think the ski was looking for a board, and sounded like he went straight past him, which is a bummer. So yeah, I think he had to get himself to shore, which is no, pretty, yeah, which is pretty gnarly, mate. That's that's fucked up. There's that yeah. many skis so, out there. Yeah. And a dude's got a near fatal injury and he paddles himself all the way to shore, which is like a 15 minute paddle basically. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad, like partly responsible seeing it and not, not knowing, but you're like, ah. but yeah, it's like so many people go down all the time there and it's just, it's a good reminder to be pretty vigilant. Even if it's not like a crazy looking wave, like people go down on waves like that all the time out there and pop up unscathed. And yeah, kind of seeing seeing the jet ski go in, we're like, oh sweet, they're onto him. But yeah, it was just a lot missing judgment, and thankfully he got in. Wow, that's uh, that definitely yeah, escape the the telling of that story that he fucking paddled yeah. to shore with uh, yeah, what was it, six broken ribs and a punctured lung or some shit. Yeah. I think he he did a he did an interview with Jamie Mitchell, I think, where he maybe it was just like an Instagram live thing, but kind of talk through it and sounded so heavy which yeah it's pretty hard yeah it's like commu- i didn't even realize he was hurt till that evening someone said like oh yeah you mate lowey got like taken away in an ambulance i was like what like i had no idea which so what what went down so like it's a paddle wave probably not what like how big like six to eight foot and he just fell on the drop yeah, that was that was like two days before the swell i think he just got in and there was, yeah, there was the odd eight. That was probably the biggest one in the morning. And yeah, he just got hung up a little bit and like fell awkward. But I think he said he hit the bottom. It, it looked like he kind of fell fell forwards a little bit awkwardly. But yeah, he said he just went up and over and like straight into a piece of coral on his ribs, I think. So it's yeah, pretty it, scary. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, that can happen. Like it, there's no rhyme or reason. It's purely like a, a numbers game it's just you're taking the odds to it aren't you like every time you surf like for sure it's like yeah you fall in the craziest wave ever out there and you don't touch the bottom but it's almost i don't know my theory is there's less water coming off like bouncing off the reef on a big wave or on a small wave out there it's like kind of like filters through the bottom and you can get caught up in it more whereas like a real big one of those like death toe waves are like it's almost like the lip hits the hits the reef first and it's almost blowing water up. Like you see that big explosion in the back and it's, I don't know. They almost seem like safer waves in some weird way. Like you get so violently flogged that you stay away from the bottom. 
yeah, that was kind of, it was just like a good, good wave on the outside ledge that did that to him. Yeah. Uh, you do hear that a bit about chopes that it's more dangerous when it's smaller or it, there's like a certain size in that kind of four to eight foot range, I guess, uh, yeah. where some, it's between the ledges. And uh, I can remember a, a local guy passing away there. It was quite a while ago now, but it was like a really gruesome, gruesome injury. Um, and I, I wonder like whether there is a couple of kind of infamous rocks that are just maybe popping up above the, the, the standard height of the coral there. But yeah, that, fuck yeah. man, that's a psycho yarn. Hey, that's heavy. Pretty gnarly. Definitely feeling for him, but stoked. He's, um, stoked. He's okay. <sighs> Yeah, mate. A mate moved into his room and ended up packing all his stuff up, and thankfully he did because it was um it was right before the floods as well. So yeah, so his stuff was all at least that wasn't insult to injury. Kept all most of his stuff, but that was that was another pretty crazy event from Chopes this last trip. Yeah, what 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 was that like? It was yeah, it was funny. We were like one straight away and pretty removed from it. It was, yeah, like we noticed there was like this big surge where the water went up like almost into our house, but it was like probably knee deep outside. And then ended up like it was just torrential rain. Had a look online and saw videos of cars floating past. We're like, what the fuck? <laughs> and yeah, just like walked down on the main street and it was just absolute chaos. And yeah, just this big surge, like the river just broke its banks and went through a bunch of the houses around there, washed, I think, I heard nine cars out there. I don't know how many actually went out there, but it was such a crazy sight. Just like big branches and cars floating, floating out in the lineup. And, and was that the tail end of the swell? Uh, yeah, that was the day after the tow day, which we surfed in the morning early. And then there was like crazy lightning out there. So we all scrambled in and like it just got, yeah, super stormy and rainy. And yeah, that would have been kind of mid morning, like just this crazy flash flood. And then by the Arvo, it was sunny, sunny again. And all the water was drained, but it was just like this crazy half hour, like flash flooding, which is, yeah, it rains a lot down there, but everyone was saying they hadn't seen that happen ever. Wow, that is so crazy. Yeah, because it's pretty mountainous, or it's super mountainous, uh, just in, in on the interior of Chope. So I guess all that rain just hits that mountain and, and just flood flashes flood, flood, whatever you call it, just fucking pours down the, the mountainside and straight through the village and just fucking takes everything out to see. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. They definitely, definitely have a bit of work to do to uh, help repair and everything. It was just like mud everywhere in a lot of the houses. Man, uh, talk us through what kind of training you're doing these days. Um, kind of nothing too fancy, really. <laughs> like, yeah, just general, like stock core and everything like that. Like mainly can do it all at home, but then yeah, free diving has been a pretty good, like, I guess, cross training, like spear fishing, free diving. That's, um, kind of my main breath work these days is just from doing that. So it's, um, it doesn't really feel like training, but it feels like it, it helps me a whole lot <laughs> after the fact. Yeah, what are the what's the direct kind of crossover between free diving and and big wave surfing? I guess it's mostly to do with um being comfortable with uh long times underwater without oxygen. Yeah, pretty much just breath holding underwater. Like, I mean, you do get yourself more relaxed free diving, but like spear fishing, you're not always like breathe. You're not really swimming up, breathing down a line, or like dropping down a line and everything. So there is a little bit more like high stress breath holding sometimes and yeah it just helps you become like pretty relaxed and become yeah good at getting that that final breath when you can um yeah it's definitely definitely helped me a whole lot i reckon mental and man in terms of like uh you know obviously you live in this this crazy life traveling around the world chasing fucked up waves that can kill you um you know, are there days when you're not feeling it? Like, and, and you, you know, what is your kind of strategy in terms of when you actually take to the waves? Like, do, do is there days where you just 
don't feel it and you push through that or, or do you listen to those days, uh, uh, listen to your mind on those days and, and not surf like? Yeah, I've definitely learned to like listen to that instinct a bit more over the years because, <laughs> yeah, if you're not feeling it, that's normally when something bad happens or like you get injured or just have a big wipeout anyways. It's, um, so, yeah, you definitely have to be in the zone. It's kind of, I say, yeah, seem to be learning to like pick my battles a bit more rather than like just go like guns blazing like every time it's big and gnarly because that's not really that sustainable but if there is like like say that ride in ireland it's like a gnarly heavy wave but it's the kind of spot where you could get the wave of your life so it's like yeah those those couple sessions i was like going harder than i would at yeah some other slabs that are like you could get a sick one but you could get really fucked up for not much not as much reward mm. so, yeah, trying to balance the risk and reward mm. and you know, how I'm feeling on the day. Like yeah, I had, it was had a Mullamore where I was like, I think last year there was one day in particular, it was like all boiling, high period and average. And it's like, I think caught one wave and just rode it to the channel and that was it. <laughs> so yeah, I got to listen to the gut feeling a bit. Yeah, yeah. How is the body holding up and, and in terms of uh, injuries and stuff like that? I noticed um, at, that, at the right, like, uh, you copped a, a lip to the head on, on one of the ways. Look like, I don't know if it tweaked your neck or you were concussed, but um, yeah. How are you feeling in terms of just where the body's at? And particularly like, I guess head injuries is, is a bit of a, a sleeping giant potentially in surfing, like you, especially in the conditions that you're sending it in. Like, is that a concern for you? Um, how many concussions have you had? I know you, you, you were knocked out cold down there uh, in, in Vico once. Um and nearly passed away. Uh, yeah. How are you feeling about that? Whether the the head and the body's at? Yeah. The, the body feels yeah good. Like in, in good shape and everything got no niggling injuries, which is nice. And yeah, the head injury I've never actually, even that time I got knocked out, I've never seemed to have experienced a really bad concussion, mm. um, which it is scary. All those little knocks. And like, that was obviously a pretty solid one. I've had, I think my worst one was maybe at Jaws in the last contest that ran, I think 2019. I was feeling like a bit funny for a couple of days, but yeah, never had a, like a bad concussion where I was like throwing up or anything. So I'm not, it's not a huge worry for me, like at the moment, but it is pretty scary what, yeah, what your head goes through getting thrashed around underwater and stuff, which I don't know, like I, you, you wear a helmet all the time, don't you? I've, kind of yeah. thought about it a bit but i've also thought i've heard some other people saying it can tweak your neck and everything like it does yeah <laughs> yeah uh, okay. good good for a good for a neck tweak that's for sure all, all those waves where you you kind of are trying to dive off and just dive through the back of it you, you, your neck gets a good wrench somehow like i don't know why that is the head doesn't seem to penetrate the water as well when it's got a layer of plastic on it but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, no one really knows. That's the the, the thing with head injuries. You, you, no one gets to peer under the hood, really. Uh, and it, it seems like the worst ones have been suffered by guys who are kind of aerial specialists. I mean, you look at Sterling Spencer, Albie Leia. I mean, guys who are spinning at high velocity through the air and just head slapping over and over again. So, yeah, I wonder, man. It, it's just the, the million-dollar question as to what, heavy waters doing to, to people's brains to oh, yeah i find some of my worst head slaps are if i come down from trying an air or a turn or something and when you poke at the bottom of a wave and like they're the ones that seem to like really sting a bit so yeah i don't know if it's like big wave surfing you get away with a lot more than what you would think but you definitely get pretty thrashed around underwater it's um yeah i don't know i've seen those soft helmets they almost seem like Maybe a good in between. Might not wrench your head as much, but give some sort of protection. Yeah, that's right. Um, ultimately, like, I feel like what you guys are trying to protect yourselves from is getting clipped by the board. Like, those boards are a glass so heavy and so big and thick. Like, freak, man. Uh, you know, surfing depot or, or one of these joints, like, fuck, it's only going to take one. <laughs> to to rattle your cage for a good while, I'd imagine copping a fucking ten foot board to the head. 
Yeah, it's the scariest part of big wave surfing. Down there, I can't believe it hasn't happened more. At the, the depot, like, yeah, you see so many people on big boards getting pinched, and it's the kind of wave that will, like, it kind of has a horseshoe on it. So it feels like, yeah, everyone's got away with quite a lot down there. The way it kind of, like, it, a lot of the time your leash won't be slack and you'll be underwater. Your leash will be slack and you'll be underwater, like, covering your head. So that's definitely a pretty scary one. Yeah, man. Well, uh, talk us through that joint, actually. I'm interested to know just, I mean, we've spoken about it in the past, but just talk us through like your journey at that wave and and how far uh, your own surfing has come at that joint from when you first started and also how you've seen surfing the level in general change out there over the years. Yeah, it's funny. It's been surfed for like ages since yeah the 2000s, really. I remember there was that footage of like Phil and Ant Macker and a few others like and Morgo towing it like way back in the day. And that was kind of when it first came out and it was kind of just a tow wave for a while. And yeah, I think my dad had paddled out there a few times, like after that, after that really big day and ended up like picking off a couple and yeah, Morgo ended up um, getting aboard to paddle it as well. So that was kind of the transition point really, which would have been, yeah like 2012 sort of thing i think and yeah kind of in those years it kind of slowly just got paddled more and more <laughs> and, and that was kind of i think my first time out there was 2011 or 2012 i was not maybe 2011 i would have been i think 14 or something and i like picked off a couple little ones on the shoulder and then morgo towed me into like a proper one <laughs> and yeah since then i've kind of just mainly paddled it and yeah, it was kind of like I used to have to razz up a crew to come out there with me. <laughs> and, yeah, now it's the exact opposite. Like, pretty much everyone's out there all the time. But it's good to see it, yeah, like being surfed to its potential. It's um, it's kind of like it's almost a lousy tow wave because it's, like, not the big ones that are, like, that you want. A lot of the times the big ones are, like, a giant kind of fat pinch and the inside double-ups are good. Mm. A lot of times towing, like everyone would just be towing big fat ones and paddling, you can kind of kind of pick off yeah, the good ones. It's definitely, definitely pretty intimidating though. Mate, it's got to be the most technical drop in the world. Like, or it's right up there. I, I don't know of a wave that lurches that hard uh, where people are swinging boards that big and, and getting that deeply barreled. It's fucking unbelievable. I, I can't believe what I've seen transpire over there um, in, in the, in the last 10 years, like you said, going from, you know, watching guys like, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? The Bartlett, Nate Bartlett and, and those kind of guys like whipping it and getting covers and shit out there. And fucking now dudes are just, it, it's packed. It's, we've like carpenters and plumbers and shit. Every swell just fucking, it's so nice. Yeah, man. It, it trips me out. It's such a potentially deadly and, and technical wave. Yeah, it's a it's a heavy wave. Like I think traveling the world has like shown me that as well. Like you come back, you're like, oh, I just surf tropes or whatever, and then you go out there and just get your ass handed to you next surf. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it seems like some people don't take it for as heavy as it actually is. Um, but yeah, how how flogged you can actually get out there. Yeah, compare it to chopes because uh, I mean, I guess it, it shifts around a bit more. It, it it's not got like that like consistent takeoff spot that that ledge that's like kind of mechanical it, it's a different beast isn't it yeah it's definitely way more of a nightmare to surf you kind of dodging waves on the head it's like yeah well it doesn't really get portrayed in footage but it's really shifty it's almost like yeah like a big beachy on a reef almost the way it like comes in like wall in doubled up and it breaks in and out and across and side to side so it handles the crowd pretty well in that way but it's also pretty hard to track track one down and be in the spot for it which is kind of i guess the big board is what's yeah what you want for that and also the way it'll lurch on you you think you're into it and then like as you get your feet it kind of like just throws this lip out underneath you so yeah definitely need that big board to get a bit of momentum in but yeah once you once you're actually on your feet and riding down the face you really don't want a big board out there either so it's um yeah definitely a pretty tricky one to figure out oh man it's insane 
talk us through that wave. I think it's the closer in, in Vantage, one of your your online clips, uh, and, and it's a wave out there. And yeah, it's right up there with the best waves that have been paddled out there. Uh, and talk us through that session and, and that wave. Yeah, that was kind of, we got these two like freak summer swells, which it still hasn't been like proper good since then. But um, yeah, the first well was when Morgo got that crazy one. A bunch of other people got really good rides. That was an uh, iconic, uh, iconic wave. And that that is the other one that stands out in my mind as just like the best wave that can kind of be ridden or that has been paddled out there. Um, and we chatted with Morg straight after that. Fucking iconic. Yeah, which I um, I split my elbow open like second wave that morning. I just came undone on a drop and like I think got. I think 11 stitches in my elbow, just like oh. just a pressure split from hitting the reef. Wow. So yeah, I got lucky that it was just a cart, but I was definitely pretty bummed. I missed that, <laughs> that good window where it pumped. <laughs> and then, yeah, this swell was like a month later. So I was like, like everything was fine, but it was still pretty fresh in my head. And I was pretty keen to get one on the board after, like after watching more goes wave and everyone else get those crazy ones. It was like, yeah, like, fired up in a good way for a bit of redemption and yeah that one came to me pretty early like I think second wave in the morning like it was still kind of sunrise and a lot of times you see those crazy big thick ones that just go top the bottom out there and you just like I don't know you almost write them off like after seeing so many without entries it's like unless like the perfect one comes and stands up at you you just don't really want a bar of it (laughs) it's just kind of too big and gnarly and a lot of those a lot of them pinch as well but then, yeah, just something about that wave. I just saw like the bowl wrap and hug, like hug the reef. And then just this perfect chipping popped up like right where I was. So <laughs> it was like, yeah, pretty perfect scenario. I was like, oh, I'll be kicking myself if I don't go this way. But it was like terrifying at the same time to actually turn around and catch it. And yeah, just kind of like let me in. It was like a big, steep, bumpy drop. But then by the time I got to the bottom, it was just like, yeah, just like the most perfect big bowl ever. <laughs> and then, yeah, watch the, I kind of thought I was like a bit wide at first, which I like kind of was in the mouth of it. But then like just the shockwave from the lip exploding, like I had to kind of pull up and ride really high. Like if I was any deeper, I would have got pretty obliterated, I think. <laughs> but yeah, that was, yeah, pretty special one out there. Definitely, definitely one of the best waves of my life, I'd say. Amazing. I'm so sick. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess when you're in flow and, and you're putting your time in and, and, and you're ticking all the boxes in life, it's almost like those waves choose you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. It was definitely, I think, wielded into existence after missing out on the session before as well. Because that was, yeah, that was like the best I'd seen it in years. And yeah, like ended up having to sit the whole session out and then to get, yeah, to get another crack like a month later was, was pretty cool. And- yeah, man. And as you, as you mentioned, like it's, it's crazy that your brain is crunching the data and the numbers and the angles of these waves as they approach it and having to make a split second decision on, on whether to swing and have a crack at it. Like that's what sets depot apart from most waves in the world. Like it's a, it's your back dooring a wave that's in the 10 to 15 foot range. And unless you're very experienced and very talented, uh, you know, there's no guarantees that you've even gone the right one. And then you've got the crowd to contend with too. So like dudes are, would be pulling back nonstop out there. I imagine, which you have, you'd have to do because not every wave is going to break the way you're anticipating. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Like a lot of waves get missed and then there are a lot of people out there kind of floating around. You don't, don't really see them catch a wave the whole time. Like they're out there having a crack, but it's also when you got to dodge boards flying around getting bailed on you and or like mid face you're trying to take off and someone's bailing their board it can be um can be a bit frustrating but it's kind of i don't know it seems like you talk to everyone around the world at each different wave and it's like it seems like it's just a bit of a phase of that happening right now but that's maybe, interesting maybe since covid it's like everyone's just coming out of the woodwork and like they're having a crack chasing waves but it's just put a lot of pressure on every spot really yeah man i don't get it like uh i just don't understand really putting yourself in positions that you you're not good enough to be in like surfing stands alone uh as far as 
any sport I can think of where, you know, you can just basically paddle out uh, to what would be in another sport. It would be like a, a freaking state championship boxing match <laughs> or a, a, a an A-grade rugby league grand final. And you can just like stroll out in the middle of that setup and just be like, yeah, I'm here and I'm ready to have a crack. And like, and <laughs> like in any of those other arenas, like you last two seconds before you're knocked out or, or, or badly hurt. Uh, and, and surfing, like it seems like there's a, a kind of a bit of luck there where people can get lucky, get seriously flogged or, um, they can put other people in jeopardy and yeah, they either don't get hurt or the other guy doesn't get hurt. And, and that it just continues. That rot continues. Like it, it just seems, seems so wrong, but I guess that's just the nature of surfing that there's, there's no real, real laws or regulations. It's like kind of up to the individual to decide. And it's, uh, I mean, I actually, yeah, it, it kind of makes me a bit sick saying, <laughs> how many people are, are out there in, in waves like that, which really, in my opinion, only belong to elite level surfers. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool in one way because anyone can go and have a crack, but if you don't know your limits, it's definitely can become an issue for yourself or others. It's um, yeah, just like the whole working up to surfing something like that. Like, I don't know, you can't just buy a big board and paddle out there the next swell. It's kind of, I don't know there's a bunch of other like big waves that are maybe a bit fatter and maybe not as good, but if you go get comfortable on those for a few swells, it would make it'd it'd make them have a way better experience out there too. That actually probably be getting waves and in the right spot and yeah, surfing it well. That's it, man. There's levels to shit. There's levels to anything, and you have to respect those levels, man. You got to tick those boxes before you you know you go to the crown jewel. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Man, uh, another wave, I was just uh, watching a couple of your clips before, and I'm actually going to put them all in the show notes. So after crew listen to this, they can uh, just click and go on a full Bjorky Berserky binge. Uh, man, uh, what is it? I think, yeah, Berserk. That That is a, is that, the, yeah, I mean, both of them have so many crazy waves out at, at Shippies. Berserk, Flow, uh, uh, the other two. And uh, man, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's Berserk and like my favorite wave of all time. I think that you've caught it, Chippies. It might be that one where, you, where you're knifing in as like a, there's a fucking two foot wave starting to develop at the the base of of a wave that's, yeah, it's basically turning to 10 foot behind you and you still got like a two foot thing at the bottom of it to Ollie. Man, uh, and, and the thing just doubles up and turns into an ice sculpture behind you. Talk us through that thing. Was that the one I fall out of? Maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You do. You. I mean, yeah, vantage, vantage point. I'm. I'm. I'm claiming <laughs> it's a make. Like you're basically you high line out of the pit and body surf. Like it's already. I feel like it's already spat by that point. It's yeah. like uh, if if I'm claiming Cole Christensen's one at Fiji is like three quarters a make. That's like pretty well a make too. <laughs> it was so sick. Like Amazing. Yeah. But yeah, I um. I think that was vantage points as well, actually. But oh, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, paddling into it, like, you know, the shape at Shippies. And I don't know, if when you're surfing it in the morning, in the right time of year, the sun is, like, in the worst possible spot you could ever imagine. So it's, like, directly, like, down the pit and slightly to the left, like, kind of, yeah, straight into your eyes where you're wanting to ride. And, yeah, I saw the line on the wave and it looked like an insane wave coming in. But I actually could not see the step until I got to my feet, like because it was wow. just, the glare was so bad, <clears throat> which is probably yeah something I should have taken into account <laughs> before catching it. But but yeah, I kind of I kind of saw the step as I was like mid face and already committed, so just had to roll over it. And I think the fact that it h- held me up a little bit on the takeoff was like gave me enough speed to get over that and around it as well because a lot of the times those ones you get over the step and you kind of stop in a flat spot but but yeah just kind of like slingshotted me like perfectly over it and just had to just hold on and dodge that lip <laughs> but it was definitely pretty terrifying <laughs> I'm, yeah pretty glad i didn't um didn't fall earlier in the wave yeah i actually can't think of a wave like that that's been ridden in surfing i can't think of another one that where someone's come over like that's a 
a, a full looks like a low tide kind of bodyboarding scenario, and you're just skipping across this thing on your your Kirkbyirk orange sled, and uh, yeah, just like the, the way the the lip kind of doubles up and has that tripped out look to it of, of like those mutant weird double ups. Like it's a really odd wave, but it's definitely one of the best that's been paddled out there. I would imagine. Like I haven't seen one like that anyway. Yeah, they're definitely. If, I think if like I could have seen how big the step actually was, I probably wouldn't have gone away. <laughs> so. Yeah, it worked out for the best, really. But I don't know if we'll be going those over and over again. It was um, it was pretty low tide and like big swell, which is when it, yeah, when it generally gets pretty steppy. But yeah, I'd ridden a few like, yeah, in the hour or so I was out before that, and they were all like the step was pretty mellow, and then that one was just yeah, horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so sick, man. Talk to us about your relationship with that way. I mean, like, when did you first go down there and uh, how has your, your kind of skill set developed at that joint over the years? Yeah, I first surfed it, I think I was 17. Went down with uh, Brett Bircher and Whippy on a trip and, um, yeah, just walked in and surfed it. And, like, yeah, it kind of just blew my mind when I got first got there. It was, like, it's kind of, yeah, coming from where I live, like, there's a lot of slabs that are kind of like a – four to six foot version of shippies that with that same like surgy takeoff and little steps and everything. But yeah, it was just on such a, such a big scale. And yeah, since even, I guess even before I surfed it, it was always like one of my like hit list waves and yeah, like clicked with it, got a few waves that I was like super stoked on that first surf and yeah, kind of, yeah, just clicked and try to get down there every swell it's um yeah it's a pretty pretty insane setup and uh yeah so who else has kind of mentored you or showed you the ropes out there obviously um birch and, and we both from your hometown have you connected with like uh the local guys marty and uh rest of the crew down there yeah since since going down there they've always been um yeah super encouraging and as a kid they were like really open to sharing like little good little insights about the wave and yeah what what to do what not to do and yeah they're kind of they're still the guys out there it's crazy how long they've been how long they've been surfing it and like had a had a paddle day last year with like marty and yeah mikey as well but especially marty was getting like absolutely crazy paddle waves out there which is it's pretty cool to see still at the drive and still yeah still like pushing himself out there and yeah, the whole, the whole Tassie crew down there, epic. It's all, they're always like a fun crew to be down there and surfing and hanging with. Marty, man, what an amazing human and an amazing surfer. I think, uh, yeah, I hope he's appreciated for what he's done out there and for what he's done for Tasmanian surfing, man. Uh, fuck dude. Yeah. Amazing. Just his, uh, his commitment to paddling out there is so admirable and, to his commitment to really like setting the tone for that place and protecting it and, you know, making sure people don't litter and like his like entire, like kind of holistic approach and his dedication to that wave and is so sick. And also like the way it's kind of been passed down through the generations from, uh, you know, Andy Campbell to him and or Andy and uh, Polonowski to him and the way they've really like cultivated a, a deep sense of respect amongst traveling surfers go into the zone and they, they don't do it in an, a violent or aggressive way. They, they, they've done it the right way. It's right. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's how a wave like that should be like treated really. Like you, if you go down there respectfully, they'll yeah be happy to call you into a bomb and yeah, be stoked with you. But if you're an asshole down there, they'll definitely, they'll tell you what's up for sure, which is, yeah, it's the way it, it's the way it should be. And it keeps it, yeah, it keeps it a pretty special, special zone. Man, what about the Cape? Uh, have you been back there many times since, since you won Cape Fear? Uh, I think I went back twice, uh, maybe two years ago now. And, yeah, I kind of swore I wasn't coming back after a couple of surfs. But that was like, yeah, crazy crowded, hyped up, hyped up couple swells. And, yeah, it was just the crowd was like a bit just everyone was fine, but it was just too thick to really like surf it how you'd like to. Like there were people towing and like 
saw like a couple collisions of like a surfer letting go of the rope and like having to jump off before they hit someone or I think yeah saw someone get pretty mowed and then you'd try to paddle for a wave and it was like you couldn't even swing your board around because there were people there like you like waves were getting missed because it was just like a traffic jam and there was like everyone was trying to get out of the way but they couldn't yeah because there were other people blocking them so it was just like yeah a pretty tough <laughs> pretty tough surf really it was yeah but i think it, it was the perfect storm it was i think in summer possibly a weekend yeah very very obvious swell but it's definitely um definitely a bit different to the bra boy days of <laughs> yeah, no one meant that to surf. <laughs> yeah well that's you know ironically what they were trying to protect it from and uh obviously i'm not gonna vouch for what they did out there but uh yeah yeah, right way, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> different strategy to, to marty and the boys but um yeah it, it's ended up like a zoo so uh I, I guess yeah that's that's what happens and it, it's it, it's weird man it's happened to kind of every wave on the east coast it, i guess when i was growing up like that wave there's you know that wave a little bit further south another mm. iconic right slab uh, and these waves, man, were ruled with an iron fist. Like you couldn't surf them unless you got the okay from the locals and the locals were psychos. So like, yeah. And, you know, like people complained about that kind of treatment. Um, and I can see why it's not nice trying to surf a joint and having someone try to either run you over on a jet ski or try and <laughs> flog you on land or like, Flog it in the water and on land. <laughs> like it's fucking pretty rough. But uh, you look at what's happened to those joints now and uh, they can never go back. Like then they're, they're going to be like that forever and, and only really get, get worse as far as I can tell. But then on the flip side, like waves, it also seems go through periods where they're really popular. Like, and then like the focus kind of shifts to a, to a different wave. Have you, have you seen that happen? Yeah, definitely. It happens to every wave, really. It's kind of like something will be, there'll be a crazy swell somewhere and that'll be like the flavor for a couple of years. Like everyone will be chasing that and kind of forget about other waves, but they definitely go through, go through runs where they're good all the time. And yeah, once, once they have a few runs of like multiple days being good, even like even a few weeks or a few months apart, it kind of like everyone catches on. And then if it's not good for a while, everyone kind of forgets what it needs and there'll be days missed and that. So it's definitely, yeah, I think kind of just goes in runs really. There'll probably be some mellow windows. How would you like to see it play out in terms of, you know, if you could just send a message to people out there in terms of just protecting waves and, and, and just showing like the appropriate amount of decorum and respect, like what does that look like? Yeah, I guess it's that, I don't know, that there's like the old school thing of not traveling in a giant pack <laughs> as soon as you get the lineup, it's like 10 people, 10 more people in it. And then, yeah, I guess the thing that I've seen really blow waves out is like the same day posting or like posting forecasts and like live, like live stories and stuff. Since that came out, I feel like it's um the crowds in the ocean really jumped. Because I'll do it. Like if someone posts a photo of a wave on the day that like I really want to go and surf that wave, I'll just go straight to Wingu or whatever and have a look at the forecast. And they're like, all right, next time it looks like that'll go. So it kind of, it really, it really blows out the forecast <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, it puts, puts a lot of heat on it for like the following swells. So yeah, I think that, yeah, that same day posting or like posting hype for swells is what's really, um, that's what's kind of changed the game, I think. Yeah, it's such a good point, man. The nuances of social media and uh, slabs and reefs, because ultimately that's kind of what we're talking about because they don't move around. So like they're they're in the same spot and break on the, the, the same conditions. Once they're dialed, they're dialed. And uh, yeah, social media, man, frick, that has fully been the death knell for all of these spots. I, I lay the blame squarely at the feet of instagram and and facebook for what's transpired at all these joints there's no other reason for it like I, you know i'm old enough to remember when it didn't exist and there was so many windows and uh now there's no windows <laughs> yeah yeah definitely i don't know forecasts got better but that was still a thing 
back before <laughs> social media. And yeah, I feel like, I don't know, sometimes fairly the blame rests on pro surfers promoting these waves, but a lot of the time it's the guy in the car park who's like just gone down there for the weekend and put it straight on his Instagram rather than like the pro is just filming a wave and going to go up in an edit that's not um not related or like not exposing a place at all. So, oh, man. Imagine how many people have gone down and, and scored waves at, you know, once fairly secret waves and just posted that straight away, like just out of sheer joy of having for the first time seen mechanical waves or like, you know, just that, that that's such a weird tendency that the modern surfer has to, to boast about how hard he just scored. And Oh my God, dude, it's so fucked up because when I was growing up, like that was what you definitely didn't do. Like you never celebrated your own achievements as a surfer. That, that, that was like, just opened you up to so much ridicule. Uh, okay. You, you had, it was, other people would celebrate your achievements or they wouldn't be celebrated, let alone like big up in yourself on fucking social media. It's a trip out. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. Nice. <laughs> it's definitely changed a bit. <laughs> oh shit, man. And what about the future, man? Like, uh, you know, what are the the objectives or, or goals from, from this point on for you? Um, yeah. Kind of keep chasing waves around. It'd be nice to, I don't know, definitely got goals to go a little bit more off the beaten path and chase some, like, a few more obscure waves that aren't, like, don't have a Chopu channel <laughs> and that sort of thing. And, yeah, try and pump out a few more films. It's been It's been a while since I've done, like, a proper, like, full-length film. So hopefully by the end of the year we'll be we'll be wrapping something up. So that's kind of a good short, short-term goal. Oh, six. Are you putting one together at the moment? Yeah, trying to from a, a bit of the Europe footage and yeah, see see what else we get this year. So but yeah, we'll probably probably have something out by the end of the year, I'd say. Epic man. And and how's your old man too? Uh like that was one thing I, I forgot to touch on. Yeah, just the relationship with your dad, Kirk. I mean, fire out last time I was down your way, uh, you know, a couple of the bombies down there was solid, like double overhead at least and he was fucking ripping dude it was actually so inspiring um so like obviously still really in touch with his surfing and his equipment um yeah what a what a magic relationship man like it's so crazy to think that you're his son and he is already so steeped in you know respect and, and folklore in the underground it's like your your bloodlines have like led you to this place it's, and he's still making your boards it's so iconic yeah it's, it's pretty epic he's he's still been surfing a bunch and still still shaping a heap so that's yeah good to see he's still got the froth still <laughs> still chasing he's away still got the froth all right holy shit so we've been been yeah working on a bunch of boards with him and everything and all everything's feeling really good so yeah, it's stoked. Epic, man. All right. Well, thanks so much for uh, giving us your time, brother. And uh, Thank you. All, all the best in uh, the future endeavors, Russ. Take care of yourself, mate. Thank you. <laughs> Good chat. Good on you, Russ. See you, brother. Yeah. <laughs>